And that is why I uh, decided to get us on Zoom because apparently when you change, you cannot change the, um, the, the paradigm. Mm. And hence, that's why we have the Zoom link. So, so Neil, were you able to send the Zoom link to everyone that you wanted to send it to? Well, I was never made host of the event. So I couldn't. You don't have to. You don't have to. Actually, so if you want to take a moment now on Facebook I, well, and just post it, the Zoom link. I did okay. uh, a different Good. invitation um, and, and posted the Zoom link. Perfect. So Perfect. Friends, yeah. So I think we're going to be a very intimate group. Um, I, I, I guess I'll make the window smaller to see who's here on Facebook. Oh, I press play. I cannot change. Oops. The, um, nope. I'm not doing that. How do I mute them? Who's here on Facebook? Here we go. I don't know. Oh, gee. Huh. So if we press play and this is happening, I guess we're not going to be in real time. So which which one should we be muting? Maybe I should just go off Facebook and then we'll just do it. Does that make sense? Nicole, you're a co-host. Yes. OK, so I'm going to go off of Facebook altogether and ask you to I don't know what you're gonna do. Okay, let me, hang on, let me get to it and see. Don't we wanna be on Facebook? Well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm seeing that we are live. There is a little bit of a delay. Is it interfering with us chatting? No. Can you hear us speaking? I cannot, no, because I don't know why. Did I? Because I muted us, right? Um, let me look. This is my first time using this too, so I can see us, but oh, oh wait. Messenger button, get out of the way. I need the thing behind you. There we go. Messenger button, get out of the way. I need the thing behind you. <laughs> the groom's okay. father has to get dressed now, he said. I, just, right, there we go. I think people can hear us now, I hope. The groom's father has to get dressed now, he said. I think it's working. Okay, I am going to mute my Facebook so I don't hear it. I'm just going to go off of Facebook all together. Okay, I am going to mute my Facebook so I don't hear it. I'm just going to go off of Facebook all the time. I am going to mute my Facebook so I don't hear it. I just closed Facebook too because otherwise I could hear it as well. Right. 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 So hopefully okay. the only thing is we won't be able to see any comments people are making um, as they're happening if we're off of it. Jeez. Let me go back in. Hang on. Well, we'll get this figured out. Oh, yeah. Two computers in front of me, and I'm on the wrong keyboard. <laughs> oh, well, then how about if you how about if you just have Facebook running on one computer, and you just mute it so you can't hear what's happening on it, but then you cool. can see the the chit chat. I will do that. Okay. Give me a second. It's going to move me around because I've actually got one computer on top of the other right now. So, Let's move me. There you go. You guys can still see me. I'll just sit like this. May I also recommend um, <clears throat> that we plan for a um, second installment of this uh, forum on, uh, it should be June 6th, but I'm not available. So I'm thinking June 7th, and that would be to celebrate the ratification of the nomination uh, from the Equal Rights Party. I think that's certainly worth taking under consideration. I would really dig that, absolutely. Yeah, I need to look at my calendar because that's my mom's birthday and I have something okay. else going on, but I don't know what it is off the top of my head. Okay. Hi, Zana, it's great to see you. Um, I. We'll probably um, recommend that we um, 
that we that we assess how this goes, but there are so many dates coming up in the calendar year, August particularly, um, that with a little bit of planning and, and a little bit more technical savvy, we could really freaking own this thing. If not start our own channel, why not? Because I think um, now that so few things have changed um, by virtue of the, the, the leaking of the draft of the Supreme Court, that um, to have this conversation happening a lot would probably be really worthwhile. It doesn't matter what side of the um, sand, the line in the sand that you're on, it doesn't matter. It, what matters is that we have this conversation because we cannot legislate other people's bodies. That's my view. Um, well, and, and the fact, well, I was gonna, it should be part of the discussion when we're live. Sure, we're live now. It's well, happening well, I, now, Neil. Okay. <laughs> I'm just not quite paying attention because I'm trying to get Facebook up on this other computer. Yeah. You want to make the introductions, Corinne? Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's May 14th, 2022. I'm Carrie Hayes. I wrote a book called Naked Truth or Equality, The Forbidden Fruit. Um, here's a copy of its current cover. La, 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 la. But I'm about to change covers, so it's really a moot point. But... Um, Naked Truth or Equality, the Forbidden Fruit, tells the story of Victoria Woodhull and her sister, Tennessee Claflin, who are first wave feminists and pioneers um, in the equal rights movement for women. With me are Eva Flynn, Nicole Evelina, and Neil, Neil Katz, who has just stepped away. Um, Eva wrote a book called The Renegade Queen, and Nicole has written a book called um, Madam President. Madam Madam Presidentess, and um, we have all written, and, and Neil's bringing his book, it's called Outrageous, and then he has another one called Scandalous, but um, both, all of these are historical fiction. These are fictionalized accounts of these two phenomenal sisters, um, and the reason that we're celebrating today is that in 1870, 152 years ago, on May 14th, these women launched Woodhull and Claflin's Weekly. Woodhull and Claflin's Weekly was a newspaper that ran from 1870 until 1876 with little interruption and constantly asked the question, how is it that women do not have the right to vote? and how do they get to be a part of the elective franchise. It also asks some very challenging questions about autonomy, agency, sexuality, and every other thing that goes with it. So today is Saturday. I'm going to turn the table over to Nicole and start with Nicole. Where did she go? Nicole has just disappeared from my screen. Hang on just a second. Where did she go? Well, I, I switched computers, sorry. Oh, but you're still there. Yes. Great. Oh, there you are. So it's because, it's because I can't get to Facebook on this computer. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Long so, story. Nicole, we're going to so start with you, you my, to put my, you in uh, a spot and in a jam. Here we go. Here we okay. are. 152 years later. Tell me, Nicole. Yes. What has changed? <laughs> Not much, unfortunately. Um, it's funny, when my book came out in 2016, uh, that was obviously an election year, and I put my book out on purpose on the day that Hillary got the uh, nomination, and that question was asked in every single interview that I did, and my answer is pretty much the same. Um, actually, I, I think we have fewer rights now than we did in 2016 uh, because of judicial decisions that have been made across the country, and... I, I say that not much has changed, but I will say that women are much more organized now and much more um, willing to voice how upset they are in general with the way things are going. Obviously, this is not all women. I'm speaking of women who are more like Victoria on the liberal um, side of things, not necessarily politically, but culturally. And um, I, I feel like there's more fight. There's more just organized gusto than we had in Victoria's time. That was just starting to happen when Victoria ran for president and you know had her, her time in the limelight. 
Um, I think she would be very proud to see the um, organization and, and it's not just women, we have male allies as well and allies of all genders. And she would be proud to see that we have taken the voice that she gave us because she was one of the first women to um, break the societal taboo of women speaking in public. You just, you just didn't do that because that was a disgrace upon yourself, upon your family. But now we kind of take, we take it for granted. And that's good because the more we speak up, the, the better, hopefully, things will be for future generations. So in a lot of ways, things haven't changed in that, you know, we still have patriarchy, we still have um, laws in this country that don't give women equal rights. Um, for those who don't know, we do not have equal rights under the Constitution. That's why we're fighting for an equal rights amendment. But yet, we are fighting. And that is something that is very different. I think that's fabulous, that the way that you've described this in a nutshell. I'd also like to turn the table over to either Eva or Neil and discuss about women talking in public and how they use spiritualism as the means to do so. Because if a woman was in a trance, therefore she would not be considered indecent addressing a large audience. Would either of you care to comment on this at that time? Eva, Eva go ahead. I think it's a very important point. I did. I have read that um, there were so many female spiritualists at that time because it's the only way they could safely talk and say what was on their mind, and you know have any influence over the men. And you know there are very several prominent men such as Cornelius Vanderbilt who went to spiritualist on a regular basis, and um, so it is one way that women had a voice. Now, of course, I guess that is one thing that's changed right now. If you know you. Uh, a president would never say that he went to see a spiritualist, you know, uh, psychics are really... Unless his name was Ronald Reagan. Yeah, well, that was Nancy who did that, though. <laughs> um, you know, most people don't have any faith in spiritualists or, you know, kind of see them as kooks or strange or, you know, just out for money. Um, but I know Neil's done a lot of work with spiritualists as well, so I'd like him to answer that question. I'm interested to see what he has to say. Carrie and Neil, you're both on mute. Sorry. Um, I think historically it's been a way for women to be able to express in town square um, to verbalize what they're thinking, um, if, whether in a trance or, or, or not. Of course, at the risk of being declared witches and, and destroyed, um, which is repeated throughout history. Um, I'd like to take a step back further than that and say that uh, I believe, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but all of us as writers of historical fiction uh, fundamentally believe that if we don't learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it. And it seems that now we are repeating it. Um, it it's very interesting that we're celebrating the first uh, publication, the first edition of woman owned and operated, women edited and written newspaper. Um, very analogous to what's happening today with Elon Musk and Twitter. Um, it's the question of how do you express ideas to the public and how do you gain a forum? Um, tragically, we're also repeating the history of the polarity. What kept women from the vote for over 50 years, um, actually 60 years, was this divide between conservative righteousness and uh, adamant, vehement uh, progressivism. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony were every bit as much to blame as the Beechers and the leaders of the Boston Brahmins. And that conflict, which all of us have exposed in our books, um, is being repeated today in you know, what, what appears to be um, this great divide between conservatism and progressivism. And it will lead to destruction as it did at preventing women from getting the vote for so long. Um, the other thing that we can commemorate uh, besides Victoria eventually being candidate for president is, is the fact that she argued before the Judiciary Committee that women have rights based on the 14th Amendment because they are 
human beings and they're citizens of the United States. Okay. Um, that's one of the inherent weaknesses of the Roe v. Wade argument. Uh, that was based on privacy, not on the fundamental right as a citizen. And, you know, these weaknesses and these conflicts um, are astonishing that they're being repeated and astonishing that they will once again set us back and create absolutely medieval um, guidelines, concepts, law um, for women. Uh, Bill Maher joked last night that if you take off from Los Angeles on a flight to Los Angeles, you're going to gain and lose your rights uh, to governing your body 20 times in the flight. Right. Crossing over different states. Right. All right. So, so let's go back to the girls, um, to Tenny and to Vicky. Uh, what, as writers, when you started this project, what did you find was the greatest misconception about Victoria Woodhull? Nicole, take it away. Um, well, first of all, the biggest thing is people had never heard of her. Um, I went to an all girls high school and I was not taught about her. So, you I mean, you would think that we would, we would focus more on something like that. But I think the, re the reason for that, there are two reasons. Um, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton pretty much left her out of their seminal history of women's suffrage, several volume um, edition. She is literally um, a footnote and they talk about the newspaper and that's about it. The other thing is there was a very damaging and mostly false, I'd say 99% false, uh, biography written of her by uh, Emmeline or Emmeline, I can't pronounce her first name, Sachs, um, right after Victoria's death. And Emily it, it, Sachs. Emily Sachs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we mean, it's interesting reading, but it's uh, very, very damaging to her reputation. She paid people um, to give her stories, and those stories were blatantly not true, but that was in a lot of ways taken as fact. So it really, nobody wanted to be associated with her, and that gets I to I thought what great... was really interesting about that, about the yes. Emily Snacks book, is that it's um, biography based on legend. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because the legends were, the legends were real. Yeah. But the yeah. legends had nothing to do with the history. Right. So, yeah. And Victoria was one of these people that legend built up around her through her lifetime. Some of it through her own doing. Um, if you look at the Completely. book that Theodore uh, Tilton uh, wrote on her that's supposedly her autobiography. Um, I mean, some of those stories are so out there that there's no way they could have actually happened. Right. Um, and, and compounding that, she later in life, you know, killed stories that were yes. accurate. Uh, and tried to control the media narrative, as any savvy media person would do. But yeah. you have this complicity and compounding of confusion because Victoria is always trying to control how people- The narrative, think. right. Now, Eva, what did you find when you started researching this? And how did you decide to address who was going to be the bad guy, who was going to be the good guy? Because you knew, you must have known when you began your journey that the Emily Sachs thing was like this huge wobbly. And then the Barbara Goldsmith book picked up on so much of it right. and really was a little bit shaky in terms of like straight on first sources. Well, there are three things I would like to just briefly mention in terms of misconceptions. And I'm not sure they're misconceptions, but things that uh, I don't think get a lot of attention. The first thing is, is that her son Byron was, you know, evidently had intellectual disability and she was blamed as a mother for that intellectual disability at that time, that it was her fault. And I'm a mother of two boys, and I can't imagine how painful that would be, not only to see your son struggling, but then to be blamed for it and be told that it was somehow your fault. And, you know, the fact that she did everything she did while at the same time being a mother to two children, one with special needs, is really astonishing. She only had three years of education, formal education, which is amazing. I don't know how she became so literate. I mean, I know she read a lot, obviously, but it's just amazing to me, you know, everything she knew and all the new ideas she had. And then it's also interesting that Frederick Douglass was her running mate, right? I mean, she didn't even meet Frederick Douglass at that time. They met years later briefly. But it's interesting that, um, you know, we don't talk about the fact that she chose an African-American male to be her running mate at the time. And in terms of, you know, bad guys, good guys, hopefully I presented people as you know, complex in my novel. There's not just one bad guy. You know, they all had 
mixed motives. Um, I will say a lot of them had very good intentions. I mean, they wanted even, you know, Susan B. Anthony, who I have a lot of problems with, she really did want to change the world. I mean, she was a strong abolitionist. She worked tirelessly for others. Uh, she worked tireless, tireless, tirelessly for women. Um, you know, even Henry Beecher, look at all he did to help uh, African-Americans, even though a lot of it was egotistical. I mean, he, he um, saved slaves, but he made them take his last name, for example, you know, and that's just is kind of a strange thing that he did. Um, you know, he sent weapons to help the um, North win the Civil War. Um, so I don't think there's any bad guys here. I think it was a very difficult time. I can't imagine living through the Civil War and seeing all the death, not only from the battles, but from the disease. And, you know, so in some ways, I feel like we're living through a civil, you know, in terms of political rhetoric, a civil war right now. But I can't imagine compounding that with all the death they saw, although maybe the pandemic is analogous. But, um, you know, I think they all really wanted the best for the country and they're all patriots. So, you know, I cut them a lot of slack, even though many of them, including Victoria, made big mistakes. I, I would argue that if there was a bad guy in the story, it would be Anthony Comstock. Um, yeah, true. Uh, historically, I'm, I, I try to believe that everybody does something good somewhere in their lives, but historically he did a lot of right. damage yes. in this country to women, um, it, specifically with Victoria and Tenny. For those who don't know the story, um, he basically set them up to get arrested uh, because they wrote a particularly scandalous issue of their newspaper. And uh, he asked them to mail a copy under the guise of a different name, to mail a copy to him, which under his own laws, he was the uh, postmaster general, under his own laws uh, was illegal because he said it contained obscene material because of certain phrases that were used. That was a um, really lousy thing to do, wasn't it? When it he really set was. them up again, the James Beardley yeah. thing. And, I and mean, they it's did. just so sickening. Yeah, and they I mean, just said, arrested. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Now I was just going to say, I also tortured Margaret Sanger years later. Yes. Oh you know. my God! And uh, there was a couple. There was a there was a, a couple who who practiced uh, who who distributed contraception who ended up committing the wife committed suicide. I yes. believe. And, and I mean, just the whole thing is just so pathetic and sad, yes. and uh, really like an ocean of uh, terribleness just like courses through this story in terms of like women deciding what is self-determination and what is what are our rights as citizens and you know um this this brings me back to i think one of the most interesting and nefarious twists and turns in this story i know how neil feels about buck claflin but i've come to my own feelings about buck because for this reason um, he was the fall guy in a lot of the history, in a lot of the story, yet he had five women, five daughters who all lived to be adults, and all of them had the um, self-worth to get divorced and remarry, in some cases more than once. And a lot of us, once we've been through a divorce, don't have that wherewithal. I mean, and when you think about whatever he taught them, whatever was going on in that family, he taught these girls that they had a right to be happy, which I think is is really interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'll, I'll completely agree with that. Of course, my premise is a little bit different. I think he abused them to the point where they could not live uh, successful lives. And the divorces were an expression of the programming, uh, the abuse as, as children uh, at several different levels. But it, it, I, it's a good argument to have, and I don't think it affects the history. Regarding Anthony Comstock, though, uh, that's as close as America came to a Grand Inquisitor. He was incredibly powerful in the state of New York and um, supported way past the borders of New York State. And uh, he really did conduct his uh, quote inquiries or enforcements uh, along the lines of the grand uh, the inquisition he, he would force people to testify he you know it, it he was pretty close to evil i agree with uh, nicole yes he's, he's also, also a mentor to, sorry i'm just gonna say i also read he was also a mentor to j edgar hoover so you know the repercussions of his personality right. and his life have still live with us Oh, absolutely. And, and in fact, people were being incarcerated under the Comstock law as recently as the 1970s. So, 
Okay. I didn't either. I didn't either. Wow. Getting back to the question about Buck, um, I think Buck is, to me, I don't feel like he was, a, a, I don't think he had his daughter's best interests at heart. I think he had his own best interests at heart. He had a history of doing things that would um, have us label him as a con man and a literal snake oil salesman. Mm -hmm. um, he definitely took advantage of whatever gifts Victoria and Ten Tenny may have had. Um, I personally believe that they did. You know, you may choose to believe that those gifts were uh, their way of coping with the abuse. Um, I've heard a lot of different, different theories, but I will say, I think that the way Victoria grew up is what gave her the determination to be who, who she became, because she said, you know, she was, well, she didn't say it. Demosthenes, her spirit guide said that she would become queen of her people. Yeah. Um, but, and she was determined that she was going to do that through the presidency. And I don't think that she would have had the um, inner willpower had she not grown up the way she did, as unfortunate Absolutely. as it was. Absolutely. And, and the manic need to remedy situations as absolutely quickest as possible, mm -hmm. uh, which is part of the, the psychological profile of someone who's been hurt that way. They can't live with the status. There, there's no tolerance for, for staying in stasis. So, yeah. Everything has to be moving all the time. Yeah. With, and, and, you know, when you think about how they caught the zeitgeist of what was going on, and also at the same time, this, this um, I, I, I want to address the misconceptions is that um, because of the way they were uh, tarred and feathered by the media and the way that it it was convenient for Elizabeth Cady Stanton, less so than Susan B. Anthony, to put them in this, this pigeonhole of being sort of um, uh, overly sexualized uh, scarlet women that um, they were always sort of ludicrous, like, you know, a little bit nutty, a little bit slutty. That What was that, the thing that they called um, the woman who, who testified uh, against uh, um, Thomas, you know, when they, they, about Anita Hill. They Anita said, Hill, yeah. you know, she's just a little bit nutty and a little bit slutty. And this is basically how Victoria and Tennessee were written off. Yes. And I think that that's just so much nonsense because um, everyone at that time, we're moving between partners. That was not an that was not uh, an uncommon thing. There was a certain decorum about it, and a certain uh, a process. Like it's when we learned that our parents, in fact, maybe had slept with somebody before they got married. That maybe somebody, you know, like oh, our parents had sex. I mean, the, the same same kind of uh, hypocrisy there. And I think that also uh, because of that, they slid down the. Um, the pages of the record of feminism. And I think that that's really a lousy thing. And I think that they deserve to be pushed back up because yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the way that the, the, the Amanda Friskin book, the Amanda Friskin book, I think is a work of genius and how she di she dissects all of their appearances in the uh, newspapers from the day's doings to uh, Leslie, uh, somebody Leslie's, Frank Leslie's illustrated news. Um, so all these things and how they would doctor their image. That's it, that's, that's the book. Absolutely. That's the book that holds the key to that these women knew that they were going to perform political theater and they were going to do it on the highest level and that it didn't matter what sacrifices they were going to have to make but that they were going to generate a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I, and that is what makes them to me really heroic. And reinforcing that, the, the fact that uh, for any woman to get ahead, um, then the natural assumption by the entire society was that she used her womanly ways mm -hmm. to do it. It couldn't be her intellect. It couldn't be their uh, foresight. It couldn't be their spiritualism. It had to be, that they were, you know, using their woman legales. Um, and, you know, that still goes on today. Uh, it, it's just assumed that someone who gets ahead, less so today, but it's still prevalent. And um, that's, that's part of the problem. 
Um, women are just not looked at as equals. They, they haven't been, and it's still extremely prevalent now going in some huge reverse gear, which is terrifying. Yeah, so is our token male. How do we correct uh, this course? How do we change well, this? I think one thing that could do it, in part, a contributing factor would be a TV series that exposes these lives and really makes them figures and makes them iconic figures for young women to look up to. Um, I'm, I'm tired of hearing about Amelia Earhart from fourth graders who have to pick a woman, right? right. Um, they could pick someone who lived a long life and was extremely successful. Not that Amelia Earhart is, is you know, not a good choice, but it, it just seems ridiculous that there aren't more iconic women for younger women to look up to. A TV series would really do it, besides the fun part of all the cameo appearances for people from history. I mean, you could have a line to bid to play Elizabeth Cady Stanton. By the way, I think the Douglas nomination was a nod to Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who the day before had chosen to support Victoria against uh, her lifelong companion and most would agree lover, Susan B. Anthony. <clears throat> and she came to Victoria's uh, alternate convention the next day. And uh, it's pretty clear that Cady Stanton and um, um, Frederick Douglass had a longstanding relationship of, of this, well, it fell country. apart. It fell apart at the, uh, the the suffragist convention the day before that Victoria was nominated. Right. It fell apart but, on that day. But at, at, at that convention, Elizabeth Cady Stanton sided with Victoria over her lifelong friend and lover, Susan B. Anthony. And I think the nomination was in part uh, a nod to Elizabeth Cady Stanton saying thank you. How um, do you think that Cady Stanton was Susan Anthony's lover? That's interesting to me. What What, what makes you feel that? Oh, there, there's a lot of documentation on that. There's, there's well, a, I know, but I, I thought that she was in love with uh, Anna Dickinson. I, I don't think it has to be preclusive or exclusive. They did live mm. together. Mm. I mean, Susan B. Anthony stayed at her home. Right. Eva, right. you wanted to say something, I think. What? Oh, I was just going to say, I thought Victoria chose Frederick Douglass because Frederick and Susan were so close and had been lifelong friends, and she was trying to piss off Susan, basically. I don't know. And you know, Susan was so close to train, and we never got into train, which to me is like an imprint, a precursor to Donald Trump, which is so interesting. I mean, is interesting. how is it that we don't get into train? Yeah, George, George Train did, I think, more damage for the feminist movement during that time yep. than, I mean, we can talk about you know, other men who were against it and, and spoke out very, very virulently, virulently against it. But his, even if you put aside the things Train said, what he stood for and the causes he supported were enough to, I mean, he's pretty much the reason why the suffrage movement broke into two parties to begin with. Right. I mean, it's not the only reason, but he was a big, a, a big factor. Um, I was going to say something else a second ago about, oh, um, as far about Douglas, my theory behind it was that they were taking two minorities, a woman and a former slave, and holding them both up on one ticket. Mm -hmm. um, it, it probably, in reality, it was probably a bunch of different things because, I mean, Victoria, let's be honest, she, there's, Susan B. Anthony got mad at her for good reasons. I mean, she basically blackmailed uh, the the high high up women in the suffrage movement saying, "Hey, I know all of your secrets," you know, and, and Neil, what you were referring to is likely one of them, um, and said, "I will print them in my paper if you don't support me." And it, it was just like, seriously, Victoria, what are you doing? You know, that's and that's one of those things where Neil, you were talking about a television series. First of all, I would love a television series either just on Victoria because she could support one alone, mm -hmm. or on the women of that time period. But I think it needs to be honest. I don't think it should be, oh, these women were so virtuous, let's put them on a pedestal. But no one is flawed. No one is unflawed. Exactly. This. Right. Exactly. And I, but I think it should be where you can see the things in them that we need to emulate. 
um, but you can also see that they were human so that we can recognize and anybody watching it can recognize that you can be just like these, you know, you can be as influential as these women were, no matter what you've done or no matter what you feel like your personal failings are. Well, I will commend, uh, it's, pardon the arrogance, but I'll commend all four of us that we don't create in our books, uh, cut out cardboard figures. Right. We don't create one dimensional characters. All of us appreciate the subtleties. And I think we all really endeavor to show the complexities, even when it's unflattering, even when it's compromising. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that would be the guiding light in, in any kind of public production. But people need to know the history. Um, are they ready for the history though? I mean, are we, we, we still You can't handle are... the truth. <laughs> we still write and we still function in this thing that I only learned the term of just last week, which is called scopophilia, wherein you, wherein the woman is a subject of a narrative, usually cinema or art, and that she is, she is nude, she, or, or she is as um, object, and that that is the source of fascination because she is object. And then you look at the stories of like Pamela Anderson or um, some other li live women who've been shamed, um, that we can only see them in this context. We can't see them as people. We can only see them in the, as these 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 objects. So like, you know, she's never going to be on the cover of uh, Harper's Magazine. She'll be on the cover of Cosmopolitan or that kind of like yeah. bent. I, I think one way that we could change that would be for the whatever. And this is just my my dreaming out loud. But you know, I won't say if. I will say when. Um, a television show, um, and I say television show or streaming series or something, something with length more than, you know, a two hour movie. When that happens, I think it needs to be done with a female at the helm because we've, part of the reason why we have that scope of philia is history has been seen through the male gaze. And when I say the male gaze, I don't mean all men. I mean the typical patriarchal mm -hmm. concept of women being less and women being object. I think if we had women telling or, or male allies, but uh, there are more female directors out there and, and script writers who I believe need to be acknowledged. That's why I'm focusing on them. Um, we need to balance out Hollywood, but that could be a completely <laughs> different panel. And, and, um, I've been, and I've been told that directly by major yeah. producers and studios that uh, they love the book and they'd love to adapt it, but they're not gonna do it with the male author. Right. Um, and you know, that's why I propose that's, among us that we, we, we sort of form a union of writers of Victoria and try to market it collectively to get the story told. And if they can be fair you. also but about men, be women at the helm. I just want to interrupt here. So yeah. just to be fair, so I'm in this hotel room because our son is getting married tonight. And while this is going on, my beloved husband has been going back and forth on his hands and knees, oh, putting on his tuxedo. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've got a it's funny, a wonderful dichotomy. <laughs> I've got a funny slash depressing story about this. So I met with a producer in New York, won an Academy Award, big, big producer in terms of their recognition. And we were talking about it. And we were talking about possible casting. We were talking about Susan B. Anthony. And I mentioned Marcia Gay Harden as a possible Susan B. Anthony uh, person. And the producer looked at me and said, well, she's not fuckable. And I thought... <laughs> This is Susan B. Anthony. You need someone who's whatever, young and whatever for that role. I mean, I was just shocked, but I think that's what you're dealing with in Hollywood. It's a very illustrative point. And because a mind, there is a mindset that the first thing you look at is the attractiveness of a woman. And you see that in the newspapers, even of Victoria's time they were more yeah. focused on what the women were wearing, um, you know, how they, how they held their, you know, held themselves, their deportment, than they were on what the women were saying. It was Gloria Steinem. It wasn't Bella Abzug. You know what I mean? When you talk about okay. eye candy and who, who, who is a, a movement going to get behind, yep. you know? And even today, I mean, we still see, I mean, I'll, I'll reference a couple of years ago, but when Hillary was running for president, they talked more about her pantsuits than where she was on different platforms. Right. And that yeah, was- but the kitten heel really got me. I mean, as a fashionista, I have to say, 
the kitten heel really got me. Why wasn't she in a stacked heel for God's sake? I mean, it was like... well, I mean, it, it, from that discussion, we could talk about uh, the dress reform movement that Victoria was a part of. I mean, well, totally. and, the and the blue dress is yes. Tennessee yeah. really um, used that as as a vehicle, um, quite quite dramatically. There's a, a story, uh, and, and it, it's depending on the source, it's questionable as to whether it ever actually happened. But Victoria, um, just for those who aren't familiar with the dress reform movement, real real quick definition. Uh, there was a, a, a movement at the time, both men and women, who were embracing um, more comfortable clothing, uh, more, we would say, free-flowing versus the corsets and the, the tightly bound um, frock coats and things like that. And they were using it not only as a source of comfort, but as a source of showing that they're revolutionary, that they the white one want equality. There were a lot of different um, causes behind it, but Victoria and Tenney both purposefully were a part of that movement. You wouldn't see them after a certain point wearing um, like uh, the traditional corsets and, and bustles bustle. and things like that. Um, and the 40 and the, pound bustle. Yeah, exactly. And the rumor goes that one day Victoria actually pulled out a pair of pants and said, or the breeches they were called at the time, and said, this is what I'm going to wear when I am president. And I mean, to, to even imagine a woman dressed as informally as they did at the time was completely scandalous, much less one actually wearing pants. There's a, speaking about the, uh, the complication of Victoria Woodhull and, and, and in, in entertainment, um, there was a movie made by, uh, about a screenwriter who has since been canceled um, named James Toback, I think it is. And he had a screenplay about Victoria Woodhull that he tried to get produced. And there's a version of this, um, a documentary that was made about him with Alec Baldwin in Cannes, trying to raise money for this cause, for this film. And it is so wonderful because it talks about how a person chases a dream and tries to sell an idea and how you try to present the financing and how it would go and how it will play out and all this sort of thing. And they never get it off the ground. But, you know, you think about the Barbara Goldsmith book. It was first optioned by Nicole Kidman or Tom Cruise for Nicole Kidman when they were married. And then when they got divorced, George Clooney bought the property. And I don't know where it's been since that time. But it's just so, I mean, she is so complex and so unknowable, really, Victoria, that we that she hovers just beyond our grasp. Like just when you think you can really get an anchor on her, she says something completely objectionable that nobody in the 21st century wants to touch with a six foot pole. It's like, oh no, 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 no. Or she does something that is like, no, 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 no. Don't do that, don't do that. But yet the idea of her is so complicated and so palpable and so living. And there's something a part of it because you know she wore her injuries on her sleeve mm -hmm. and she wore her compassion and her strength and her fire. And it's just like, what? I mean, we are going to figure it out. This, this round table, this group of people, we are gonna figure it out. And one day all our names are gonna say executive producer, blah, 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 blah. But, and we'll all be unhappy with the series. We'll say, oh, if only they did what we said. By the way, Alec, know, Alec Baldwin would make up Tremendous Henry Ward Beecher. He'd well, be you know, great. I think his career is uh, going to be on pause for a while. But yeah. um, you he know, so it, it's just really fascenating to me. I always we thought don't that have a Susan B. Anthony movie or series either. And look at uh -oh. all Susan did. I mean, she's on a coin, but yeah. um, you know, how many John F. Kennedy movies do we have? How many John F. Kennedy TV series do we have? And right, yeah, I would think they're one of these limitations. And he had a sex addiction, and we're like, oh, yeah. that's okay. That's okay. I honestly think that each one of our books and, and others, you know, sources that we have consulted, I, I'm sure all of us, oh. um, but nonfiction as well, could be made into movies, series, et cetera. And we still wouldn't have the full picture of who Victoria is. Absolutely. No, we wouldn't. Or, or Teddy, for that matter. I don't mean to, to exclude her. It's just my research focused more on Victoria. Yeah. Right. So. Well, well Victoria is the marquee name. Yeah. You know, Tennessee is actually more of the, the history of what was going on because I mean none of us no one would know that she, her name was in the papers all the time and uh Victoria was sort of directing things yeah, and also Tennessee had this extremely promiscuous reputation but there's like no one on the record with whom she was having an affair except up, for being John up until, Green, you know? I mean the, the the early years and and everything that we covered in our books 
up to 1876. After that, Tenney continues a meteoric rise of influence and public, public uh, presence, whereas Victoria really does suffer the consequences of the acts of Comstock yeah. and others. Um, well, I think, yeah. Heavily on her. Go ahead. I think, I'm sorry. I think Victoria tried to tone it down for her second husband oh. or third husband uh, in England. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 It's almost like Victoria or, that Tenny needed Victoria to step aside before she could shine. It was like she was in Victoria's shadow. And it's very, very interesting. I mean, my, my research doesn't go nearly as much into that part of Victoria's life as, as, as all of yours does, because I ended my book um, with them being in jail and did a very small epilogue of the rest of their lives. Right. But um, I, I feel like it's almost like Victoria paved the way for Tenny, probably unintentionally, but as much as those two loved each other, I, I'm sure she was grateful for, or seemed to have loved each other. Um, and then they were estranged for years, you know. Yes, they were. In England. Yeah. By the way, how do you guys look at, uh, and what would the public perception be of uh, Tennessee and uh, Cornelius? <laughs> I mean, I have it as a true affection and, and love affair. Well, it's very New Yorkish. It's a very New Yorkish relationship. If you're a man who has everything, why wouldn't you have a wife who's, you know, 50 years your junior, or a girl, you know, mm -hmm. on your arm? It's a, in, in New York, it's super common, you know, for gajillionaires to have these very young women. Yeah. And I don't think Tennessee had any issue with men in authority. Right. She was comfortable with them. And I, I think she had enough, uh, it, well, I mean, my premise is that she had enough sexual agency that she wasn't going to get tangled up in whether he was going to be a satisfying lover or not. And also because, you know, it, it, in that aspect, it's about the fountain of youth, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, mm -hmm. when you give somebody the joy of the fountain of youth, they become phenomenal. And obviously Cornelius was a very records, handsome, virile guy. According to all records, he was constantly revived whenever he saw tennis. Exactly. So, I mean, and, you know, there had to be a lot of give and take, and I'm sure he also um, mentored her in her yes her uh her financial um prowess that's yep. what i was, yep. was going to yep. say my my personal theory as to how they how victoria got from you know three years of formal education to running the first female stock brokerage is that cornelius is the one who taught them i mean i we, well, I, can't right, well, James, blood. I mean James, blood I, had a lot of yeah james blood had a lot no of, i'm talking about james Hart, yeah blood yeah blood had a lot of um he, he knew the ropes and all that sort of thing but i think i really theater. I think that they, you know how the Kardashians are always portrayed as these very frivolous characters. And now they're now they're less so, now that Kim is gonna be a lawyer or whatever. But I think that um, what we see, what is portrayed and what is actually true are very different things. Mm -hmm. With people who generate that, that kind of um, financial engine around themselves you know, what it takes to be successful for that long in that that vein. And, and you know, the Kardashians are a very apt um, comparison because mm -hmm. the family was about as dysfunctional as you could get. Um, I used to always say, and it's really not as applicable anymore because it's not on air, but that they could have been on Jerry Springer show constantly. Oh God, um, I knew it. You know, it's, and it's, they were very publicity seeking, all of them. I mean, I- Polly, geez Louise, Polly is terrifying. Yeah. And then so, Utica got lecturing like, against the against suffrage. I mean, my God. I hate to shift off the Kardashians, but let me pose a question that I'm I'm really curious about. Sure. We all understand the um, in, impending conflict and the great divide of polarity that reflects the period we wrote about. How do we avert it? How do we influence it? How do we somehow get? wildly progressive, adamant activists to sit down and respect the opinion enough to listen to arch conservatives and vice versa, because it's the lack of dialogue, it's the lack of mutual respect and right. humanization that makes overcoming the divide next to impossible. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd love to hear any input, because I think that's part of our responsibility as historians is not to just point out the past conflicts, but try to, to divine or spiritualize or at least contemplate a roadmap to avoid the same thing happening again. Mm -hmm. I think, well, go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say, go ahead. 
we have to, like you say, we have to be able to be kind and respectful and very, very uh, generous in dialogue with people who think differently than ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we have reached a point where thanks to social media, thanks to the media, thanks to 24 seven news, something is only good or something is only bad. It's not, we can't seem to understand that really elegant, kind, wonderful, witty, intelligent people can have polar opposite views. And, it, it, and, and I think that having dialogues like this, where people just start talking, and I think it would be even much more interesting the next time we get together, if we had people who absolutely disagree with everything we think and have a really nice convivial conversation, I think that would be fun. And, and that's the, that right, what you said right there is you have to go deeper. You can't just have a surface soundbite, which is so right. much of what we focus on in the five seconds that people take to read things and form an opinion. It's, it's the nuances on both sides of the um, mindsets, or I should say all sides of the mindsets that I think will get us to where we can bridge our gaps or at least agree to disagree. Um, and to, to answer the question of, of what we can do on an individual level, um, Victoria and every one of the women in the suffrage movement would say, first and foremost, vote. Mm -hmm. Go out and vote. No matter which side you're on, go exercise the right that women spent 70 something years fighting you know, to, to get. And the other thing is to, we have groups now, you know, whether it's the League of Women Voters or um, AAUW, those are women's groups that, that come to the top of my mind, but there are plenty of others. Join with those groups and speak out. You know, you, you need to, even if you don't have a platform, voice your opinion. You know, it's, it's the voices, it's the, the voices lead to the discussion. And I think the discussion leads to as close as we're going to get to understanding, but you have to have an open mind and you have to be willing to listen in addition to speaking. I think also th this idea of understanding how is it our politicians have um, fallen in such lockstep out of fear of not being reelected or something like that, mm -hmm. that they can only respond to something which needs to be discussed as a block. You know, it's like every Republican senator or congressman has to vote thus, and that they are afraid to vote actually as their constituents might want or as as even their mothers might want i i, I think it i think this is something that's worth discussion it's it's deeply complex but i would like to i would love for the last 10 minutes that we're on online together um is to talk about uh our beloved protagonists spirits coming and tapping us on the shoulder and what she said when we brought her into our lives and she has now will be staying with us obviously forever. So um, Neil, we're gonna start with you. Well, I think we should start with Ava. I haven't heard. <laughs> Ava, it's up to you then. Here you go. Ava. When did she come into, I know it started with you reading the encyclopedia, but when did she say, okay, Eva, now you're gonna write about me? Oh, it was around 2015 and I, Constantly, we, this sounds crazy, but I think every, I think we're all crazy, so we all understand. But <laughs> I would have uh, visions of her coming to me, you know, and telling me that she wants to be known and that she wants people to hear her story, and that I should do this. Of course, now my comment back to her is that she needs to make our TV series happen because she must have <laughs> some power out there in the spiritual world. Um, so you know, I, I'm putting it back on Victoria. How long, how long was she, she taunting you? So when you read about her in the insight, from the moment you read about her in the encyclopedia mm -hmm. until you picked up your pen and you said, uh-oh, here Probably we go. Years. I would say 30 years. 30 years. Wow. Oh. I mean, I, how, still, I still talk to her sometimes. How much did you read around and about her until you picked up the pen? Oh, I probably spent three years reading old newspapers and reading biographies and so forth. Yeah. You know, it's it's a big commitment to write a novel. And I think we should all be proud of ourselves that we even finished it. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, I have my own business. I've got children. I've got sick parents I'm taking care of. It is a big, I don't know if I want to say sacrifice because I enjoy it so much, 
but you know, it takes discipline and patience. So, you know, it, it, we all gave ourselves to Victoria. So we should all be proud that we finished, honestly. Agreed, yeah, agreed. Uh, for me, it was uh, 2011, a uh, book came out in 2000, actually the end of 2010, book came out in 2015. <laughs> Um, and um, three years of just reading everything I could about the era, era uh, as well as the literature of the era and uh, all the histories um, from every perspective. And you guys know I cover the financial side and studied that as well because that's my background, um, you know, my career, but um, before I retired. But um, basically, I, I died in the hospital. Uh, they didn't declare me dead because it was too soon. But uh, after that, she was in my mind telling me she wants her story told. Um, in part because of that very disorienting experience, um, I actually took a class with the uh, Metaphysics University in San Francisco and learned about astral projection and, and summoning spirits and talking to people. And using Victoria, in, in my mind, uh, I say that in an in interview on YouTube, um, I have spent time conversing with uh, Henry Ward Beecher, Cornelius Vanderbilt, Tennessee. And after uh, about half the book being written as a first draft, um, you know, I just said flat out to Victoria, am I missing anything? And she, and she laughed and said, yeah, you're missing the whole point. And I said, what's that? And he said, you got to focus on Tennessee. So book one is more of the story of their rise and focused on Victoria, but book two is definitely the emergence of Tennessee. And if, if there's ever a book three from me, then uh, it will be uh, Tennessee's focus with uh, Victoria as, as a, uh, a background character. But um, the ability to interview people, we all have, um, you just have to be really, um, disciplined about find, you know, leaving <laughs> a way back to this reality because you can get pretty lost. Um, that takes some work and some discipline. But um, I think all of us share the experience that we, we believe quite strongly in that. All right, Nicole, how did it happen? Madam President Tess, which is the most impossible thing to say. I don't know how she ever thought that was a good idea. I was just going to say, <laughs> President Tess is Victoria's word. That's I know. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. Yeah. She signed her, her letters at some point, uh, future president tests. No. And uh, so that's, that's where the title came from. Nobody can pronounce it. Um, I, part of me, I mean, I love the title, but part of me in, in retrospect is like, should I have just called it Madam President, you know, instead? But anyway, um, I, I unfortunately came to Victoria through much more mundane means. Um, I, I think it's fascinating the experiences that Eva and Neil have had because Victoria was a spiritualist. So, you know, it's so appropriate that someone who believed so much in, in, you know, life after death and being able to communicate with spirits is doing the communicating now. Um, but I actually came to her through a pin on Pinterest. Um, I have a friend who has a board that she just pins pictures of people that she finds fascinating and she might use them in, in future books. Um, she's a novelist as well. And I saw the picture of Victoria one day and the caption was actually a fairly lengthy one. And it said, you know, called, this isn't the exact words, but it's something like that. Uh, called Mrs. Satan by her detractors, Victoria Woodhull was the first woman who ran for president, but we don't really know who she is. And I was like, well, this is really interesting because my whole thing as a novelist and quite frankly, even in my nonfiction is to tell the stories of women who have either been forgotten or are in danger of being forgotten. And so if she, I thought, if she's called Mrs. Satan, I need to get to know her better. And the more research that I did, the more fascinating she became to me. And I realized that there was a really good, at the time, you know, relatively untold story there. And this was around the same time that Eva was writing her book, Neil had his in, in production. So, you know, it's like Victoria was probably out there somewhere going, okay, you know, I'm going to. I'm going to pick a bunch of people and somehow or another, this is going to work because I want my story out there. I mean, I didn't have a personal experience with her. This is, but... so, this is so true because, you know, Nicole, I mentioned to you how I was in, London, in, in Oxford the same time that you were and I picked up the card and this is yeah. 2016 and I just finished my book and, 
And you know, that's exactly how these two women were, the sisters. They were like, because I was writing something else and I was really deeply into it. And it was really like, I was enjoying it. I wasn't not enjoying it. And, and they, they, they both were like, okay, that's nice. That's nice. Okay, now you have to write about us. <laughs> now you have to write about us. And I mean, how one's mind kept going back, kept going back, kept going back. And you know, it was the Barbara Goldsmith for, book that got me because I had known her as a child. Really? And I was in the public library and I'm looking around for things about feminism, feminist history, because of the project I was working on that had nothing to do with this. <laughs> and there was this book. I thought, hmm, Barbara Goldsmith. I never heard of this book. And, you know, because I, I only the last time I'd seen her, I was 19 and I was now 40 something or 50 something, something but I was old. And so I pick up the book and I take it to work with me and I'm reading it. I can't even believe what is in there. I can't even believe this story. I can't even believe this story and that none of us know it. Right. And the book was 10 years old at the time that I was yeah. reading it. And then I picked up the Joanna Johnson book, Mrs. Satan, which is so like, Wah. and then, you know, and then, and then it, this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing. And it kept, and you know, what's so incredible was how so many of the stories were contra contradictory. Mm -hmm. And then it really brought home how much of history is he said, she said, he said, she said. And then the James Baldwin quote about how history lives inside of us. And then Doctorow's stay, saying, Yale Doctorow's thing about how history is in fact myth. And we it is. use it true. with fact, but it's really, it's the stuff that survives that is good narrative that we respond to as this is history. And it, it just um, was the most humbling and frustrating and awe-inspiring experience and, and I'm still in it, but I mean, it just, it's been really a thrill and I, and I, I marvel at the energy of their, their story to, to, to touch us even now. It's really something for me. Yeah, for, for me, I was very fortunate that researching Victoria, and I would love this to, to lead into um, what is personally my next question for everybody. Um, it, my, the, the question being, um, what are you guys working on now? Um, well, you know, what's, what's next for you? Are you still working with Victoria? Are you, are you working on something different? Um, for me, because I did the research into Victoria, I came across a woman named Virginia Minor. Um, and, and not to use the ubiquitous pun on her last name, but she was a very minor character in um, my book. She is she is mentioned very briefly. Uh, she was very important in the women's suffrage movement, but has been um, forgotten. And even though she, opposite of Victoria, was covered extensively in Susan B. Anthony and uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's book. But my point being, uh, there is a chance that Victoria saw Virginia speak at the National Women's Suffrage convention in 1869 in St. Louis, where she and her husband Francis put forth this, that, that theory that um, women had the right to vote under the 14th Amendment because it had gender neutral language. It didn't say men, it said people. So it wasn't Benjamin Butler who pushed this idea? No, it was it was uh, Virginia Minor and Francis Minor. And That's we can very interesting. historically prove that. Um, that led to that little bit which led to Victoria, well, I call it a little bit, Victoria, you know, speaking before the House Judiciary Committee on exactly the same subject, for me, led to a biography of Virginia and Francis Minor, which had never been, they've never been written about before. So for me, not only did I learn about her and get the chance to tell her story, because I told her story, I then got to tell these other two people's fa fascinating stories, which have then actually led to a future biography, but I won't go into that. It's just very interesting to me how one thing is leading to another for me. And really through my research for her uh, on Victoria, I found a true passion for the women's suffrage movement um, mm -hmm. for myself. And if I ever get a chance to go back to school and get my PhD, that's what I'm focusing on. Yeah. So it's been a very rewarding personal experience for me as well. Eva, what are you doing now? What are you doing now, Eva? <laughs> Well, I started writing a second book about um, Victoria, but I just kind of gave up midway. I just wasn't, it wasn't gelling for me. Uh, so I've written a, my latest project, I live in Indiana. We have a school called Christmas Addicts, which is an African-American high school. 
And in the 50s, they were the first African-American team to win the basketball championship in, in, in the entire nation ever. And it was led by Oscar Robertson, who is a NBA uh, you know, Hall of Fame. So I've written a movie about them and I'm trying to get that made right now. Oh, cool. Thank you. That's great. I hope you don't want Marsha Gay Harden to be in it. No, <laughs> not a role for her, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, you're on mute. I don't know if you know that. Okay. Um, that's why you haven't been responding to my comments. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, Nicole, I said you've already earned your doctorate. It would just be a question of formalizing it at a university. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, clearly. Um, I'm actually shifting to contemporary times to address um, an underclass of citizens that are berated and not uh, appreciated and uh, trying to write it uh, from historical context, actual uh, case studies, and um, again, with the eye of a, a, a TV series that would be a um, episodic um, telling of, of these specific lives and cases uh, that make up the body of this group. So um, it, it's a lot of research, a lot of learning stuff I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it's, I'm, I'm excited to be working on it because again, it's, trying to get people to shift their perspective and accept a much broader concept of humanity and how important different elements of society are. So that's what I'm working well, on. Well, I'm going to round it up here because um, I have to go get ready to, for more frolicking. But um, for me, I, I've been working on uh, the sequel to Naked Truth. It's called A Well-Dressed Lie. And the man you saw walking in the background, back and forth, getting his clothes on, <laughs> is the one who actually gave me the idea for the title because he's not much of a reader, but he's really good at these things. Yeah. And um, uh, it's it's about Tenny and uh, Victoria's adventures in England, and how Victoria adjusts her 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 role of herself and her view in order to be able to be with her third husband and how Tennessee must um, uh, adjust her, her, her trauma from, from what they both went through um, uh, in, a, in an appreciation of uh, faith and art and what is free will and how do we go on and um, about uh, the life well lived being that which serves others. And um, that's, that's basically what it's about. And it's supposed to be finished. I'm supposed to be giving it to my very esteemed developmental editor who happens to be here, Kim Taylor Blakemore, represent. But <laughs> instead of going to weddings and having Zoom calls and doing all kinds of other stuff like that. So I love you all. And I Tennessee respect certainly you so created, very much. What? Tennessee certainly created a gilded cage for herself, the castle in uh, Portugal. And you got Portugal, it. Turn it up to 11, just like my eye makeup. Really so <laughs> <laughs> I wish you a very marvelous rest of the weekend and thank you so much for joining me and let's do this again. Yes. Everyone agree? Okay. Agree. Yes. Thank Thanks you for lot. having us and enjoy that wedding. Okay. Take it yeah, easy. Have fun. Happy birthday. Thank okay, you. Happy birthday. Thank you.